And I'm not seeing whether Jeff Stum or um, Houston Gibson have joined us. And I if was you have, just looking great. and I didn't see them. I didn't see them either. So if they're I'm online go ahead and, get and they're under anyway. an assumed name, go ahead and speak up, please. <laughs> uh, no. oh, okay, Jeff. here we Jeff's go. on now. All right, exactly on time. Uh, well, welcome to Great Race 101. This is what rookies need to know to be successful in the Great Race. And um, just go ahead and flip to the agenda, if you would, Ken. And we're going to start with just welcoming and a little housekeeping. Um, and uh, just want to introduce ourselves. We're Janet and Steve Hedke. We've been great racers since 1999 was our first regional rally. And uh, we've done quite a few since then. And uh, we keep coming back for more for some reason. And uh, we have... Uh, been the rookie coordinators for the past year and uh, really enjoyed getting to meet some of our rookies and, and to just kind of share some of our experiences to make your experience better. Well, and I'm Steve. I'm the driver. Janet's the navigator. Uh, it works best that way because uh, I've tried navigating and it was less than successful. The uh, So you, you'll you learn your, where, where your skills lie. Uh, but we're, what we're trying to do today is give you a idea about what you're going to be looking forward to as you go. It's really exciting. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you are excited to be in the race, uh, even if you're not exactly sure what you're going to be looking at. It's got to be, as far as I'm concerned, it's the coolest thing you can do with an old car. I mean, you can take an old car out to Pebble Beach and park it on the lawn. And if you spend enough money on it, you're going to get a trophy. You know, this is entirely different. You know, you and your teammate and your car all have to perform. It's challenging. It's it's an endurance event. And, and we'll get into that later. So let's let's uh, just continue on with the agenda. We're going to have some announcements from Jeff and uh, Houston. Uh, we'll talk about how to prepare before you leave. We're going to talk about the roles of the driver and the navigator and uh, what we'll be doing when we arrive in Owensboro for the start. We'll talk about what the day in the life of your great race team is, what, what you can expect. So you get an idea of, uh, so you're not drinking from a fire hose when you get there, which you will be, but at least you'll be prepared for that fire hose. Um, and we'll give you some sample course instructions. We're going to go through those, um, you know, instruction by instruction so that you're really comfortable with the idea of, of what that big fat packet of paper is that they'll hand you every morning. And uh, then we'll talk about some special circumstances that you may encounter or you may not. And uh, then we'll have some opportunity to answer some questions. So um, on to the next slide. Yeah. And the next slide. Um, okay. So um, Ken, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself as well. So um, just kind of the housekeeping of uh, how the Zoom works and... and uh... Yeah, hi, I'm Ken Spencer and this will be my fourth great race and I'm a navigator also. Mm -hmm. And all I can say is it, it is such great fun and okay, also the people you meet. It's, it's just, it's, <laughs> and you're going across real America and it, it is really, really nice. And uh, I've, this is the second one I've uh, helped out with, with Janet and Steve. They do a great job. So we're in good hands. I'm just going to be behind the scenes and I may mute your microphone or anything like that. Like if we hear a dog barking in the background or anything like that, but thank you. Welcome and enjoy. Okay. Oh, it's my turn. It is. What am I talking? What well, is the great race? Oh. I need new glasses. <laughs> the Great Race uh, is a time, speed, distance, endurance rally. You're given the time and the speed, but not the distance. So in order to get a good score, you need to stay on course and on time and at your correct speed. Uh, sounds easy enough to do. Uh, there are lots of things that can get in your way and make that a little harder than it needs to be. But the challenge is that your team needs to be able to communicate back and forth, uh, have a common uh, language and terminology that you can use for the things that we'll be talking about later, and um, have a car that's reliable. Uh, virtually any car can win the race. 
the team that uh, has the best preparation usually does well, but not always. There are things that happen and you have to have a mentality that's flexible. Uh, if things don't work out the way you wanted them to, there are ways to fix it. So what we intend to do here is give you some ideas of how things go when it's normal and what you can do if it's not. Okay, and um, go on to the next slide. And I'd like to introduce our uh, director of Great Race, Jeff Stum. Howdy. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Jeff. There you go. He's unmuted. Now he's muted again. There you are. That's right. Yep. yep. Steve and Janet, thank you all for doing this. Thanks to Ken for putting this together. If you uh, have questions, you can do it, and, and Ken will take all that and uh, make this a very nice uh, presentation. I'm just here to, like you, to listen. Uh, if if anything uh, technical comes up, I'll be glad to answer it. Keep in mind that when this is over, you're going to come up with more questions. We're here. Your mentors are here. Steve and, 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 and Janet are here. I'm here. Houston's here. We're glad to answer any of these uh, uh, questions or calls at, at, at any time. My cell number is in the bottom of my signature on my email. You all should have at least gotten at least one email from me uh, throughout the last year. Uh, so I just want to make, we want to, we're doing this so that you have fun and that you you understand it going in so you ha can maximize your fun and uh, to keep you from uh, disrupting anybody else that might be around you that's really trying to do better. Not everybody's trying to win $50,000. A lot of people have realistic expectations. Uh, we actually more gear the race to you that have the realistic expectations. You're out there to do as best you can. Uh, 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 you know, have a good time. And a lot of you, I feel like the crack cocaine dealer. We give you a little taste <laughs> and then you're hooked. Because it's a true. lot of you Guilty. will come back and do this for Steve and Janet, been on 25 years. This is actually the will be my 30th year. Uh, my first race was in uh, 1994, so it's um, and it goes by fast. So uh, you know we're here for you. Anything that you might need, um, I do want to. I'm sure this will come up, but if you don't have a speedometer, you need to get a speedometer, and you need to to let us know. We might can find a used one. Uh, we might, even if you have to buy a new one, um, it's, they're, they're very expensive, but they have, uh, they hold their value. And, uh, I think to maximize what you want to do, even if you're just having fun, you're going to want to have a, a speedometer. So, um, I know a lot of you will be in Michigan. Uh, I, I will actually be in a Michigan in Michigan six days from now. I'll, I'll be arriving on Monday. Uh, uh, Houston rides on Tuesday, and I know a lot of you will start piling in there on Wednesday and definitely by Thursday. Mm -hmm. um, it, what a great opportunity for you to, number one, have fun. It's going to be a lot of fun things from the Packard Proving Grounds to the Stahl Museum to the Will St. Clair Museum, uh, Frankenmuth, uh, Michigan, uh, just a lot of great uh places to go, things to see and people to associate with. And we're also going to rally some. And it's, <laughs> it's better that you come and figure something out on the spring rally. Make that mistake on the spring rally instead of on day one of the great race. There's also a trophy run the, the day before the great race starts in Owensboro, uh, which will also give you some valuable seat time uh, before the race starts on that Saturday. So. Uh, I'm going to mute myself back. Um, Houston, do you have, if you have any housekeeping items, uh, chime in. Uh, I think he was at a funeral today. Uh, I'm here. I think, if you have any housekeeping <laughs> uh, items, uh, now's the time. I'm going to mute. And I, if anything uh, technical comes up, I'll be here and be glad to answer. 
Yeah. yeah. As he mentioned, I'm Houston. I'm the coordinator. So hopefully I've, I've probably talked to a lot of you guys over the last couple of months, getting you ready for the, the big race. Anything you need, feel free to reach out to me direct if I hadn't talked to you. Uh, as far as housekeeping, probably the biggest thing is just making sure that it, uh, we have either you've emailed to me or it's on your profile, uh, you know, the all your photos and the insurance for your race vehicle. We want to make sure everybody's got updated insurance on the vehicle they're going to bring to compete in. So uh, anything you need, I'm Houston at greatrace.com. So look forward to meet you guys all in person. Okay. And um, just if if you do have questions along the way, um, don't unmute yourself and ask them out loud. You can you can type them in the chat and we'll see if we can kind of get to them along the way, but we will have a, a designated question and answer period at the end. So um, we'll, we'll see if we can kind of keep an eye on the chat just in case, um, but um, let's go ahead and move on and talk about how to prepare yourself in your car before you leave. So next slide. Um, Steve and I have competed in a number of different vehicles over the years, and uh, choosing your car is something very significant that you want to make sure that you've got it adequately prepared. So uh, next slide, and Steve will talk about uh, those specific preparations. Well, there's a picture of the time-wise right there. Um, I've got mine handy here, and we can uh, uh, talk about it as she's opening up the case, which protects it because it's been all over the country. It's tougher than nails. Everywhere, man. So this, can I get it in focus? I'll Put try. it nearer your face. There you go. Oh, okay. I can do that. Oh, Did that no, work? No, lean forward. Yeah. <laughs> well, the picture on the screen is the same. Yeah. The trick with this thing is that it has four holes in the back. This is what you uh, adjust to set your factor. Every morning, uh, you'll go out and do a speedometer calibration run, and it will tell you, you're trying to hold 50. And if the speedometer says 50 and the time works out on your sheet, then it's fine. Chances are you're going to have to adjust it. And these things are adjustable down to a fraction. They're very accurate. And uh, the reason that they are as expensive as they are partially is because they're tough as nails. They'll they'll take a, a tremendous beating. They're actually quite heavy, and uh, the adjustability of it, so you can you can get it precise. Um, but the reason we talk about having a speedometer like this is because the a speedometer that came with your car is no damn good, and uh, we're talking like. On our 64 Studebaker, the factory speedometer, which is a Stuart Warner, uh, is about two miles an hour slow at 50. Now, for a factory speedometer, that's pretty good. For great race, that's crap. Uh, you're you're going to lose time all day long with something like that. So the you don't you can use a factory speedometer, but you have to do mathematical calculations all the way on your trip to compensate for the loss. And your navigator's already got plenty to do without having to do that. The time-wise just makes life so much easier and it will make your, you'll score better with it. The, um, what are we talking about next? Tires, I need glasses. <laughs> um, the, we ex we expect that your cars will be prepared as if they were going on a long trip, meaning that you're not going to put 12-year-old tires on your car. Um, and you want to use a, a tire that will um, last. Uh, the roads are tough. And we normally put the pressures on the tires up at least to maximum. And some folks might push it just a little bit harder just to keep the tire from expanding and contracting and throwing your speeds off. But uh, sometimes the the, right, the race route can't help it. The, the, the teams that go out and prepare the course, we could have a construction crew come through after the sweep truck or sweep car goes through. And we had that happen last year. We were driving along and all of a sudden, uh, three inches of asphalt disappeared under the car. Um, and, you know, we took a bump. 
and it was on a time section. And the you know smart thing is to slow down and make up the time, but there was a stop sign within sight. Didn't think for anything too, yeah. Yeah. Well, the uh, just to say that your car needs to be able to take a hit and make sure that you know, maintenance items. Obviously, you're going to change the oil and the filters, uh, grease up wheel bearings. All of those things need to be done. And then try the car to make sure that everything's okay, especially if you're doing a tune-up on it. Put some hours into the car before you load it on the trailer and take it to the race. Spare parts. Normally, what I bring in the car are the things that I can change on the side of the road. There will be a sweep truck. If your car breaks and you can't fix it, just keep it on the race route, get it out of the way of traffic, and a team will come and pick you up and bring you back into the hotel. Uh, there's no reason to try to replace a drive shaft on the side of the road during the race, uh, although I've seen it done. And um, you know, anything that you can replace quickly, carry with you. Because um, when you get back to the hotel, there are people who will chase down and help you find the replacement part you need to get you back on the road the next day. One of the coolest things about great race is how much the other teams will help folks get their car back on the road the next day and uh, they could beat them uh, in the competition, but that's not the part, the point. The point is that everybody gets to go. Um, the performance chart, are, are we gonna talk about that together? We will talk about that later. So, but you'll need to be testing your car and can't see it. Yeah. All right, well, we, it's in the slides. Well, well, you need to know how long it takes for your car to get up to and to slow down from given speeds up to 50 miles an hour. You need to know what your car will do because that's how you calculate your timing. And then the decals will be sent in the mail. I understand from Houston that we're going to have some of them, I think, for Michigan. Hopefully, that have to be in the next couple of days. Um, but regardless, the decals are required. If you have a show car, there, you don't like to stick stuff on your car, that will be a problem. Uh, the decals are required for the sponsorships that help pay for the race. And uh, yes, time out. If you're, if you come to the spring rally, if you any team in the spring rally, and we have 90 teams in the sp spring rally, they're not all in the great race, but I would say 75 plus are in the great race this summer. You will receive your set of decals for the spring rally, and you will receive your set of decals for the great race. If you're not in the spring rally, when we get back from the spring rally, we will mail you or FedEx you your decals. So if you're, uh, I don't even, I don't know if Bob Merrick, Merrick's coming to spring rally or not. I can't remember. He but is. if he, he is, he is. Well, if he wasn't yeah, coming, I'm I, soon as soon as soon as I get back, I would mail him his his decals if he wasn't coming. And yeah, there are people in the spring race who are using rental cars and uh, other things like that. Will, and there will, will be a, there will be a, they will have a, uh, a spring rally door decal to go on their car that is different than the great race door number decal. Okay. So that way you can take your, you, you, if you're in a rental car, good question, Steve. If you're in a rental car, you get your spring rally decal, you get your great race decals, you would put your spring rally decal with your number, and they all should correspond with your great race number, but it's a different decal on your car, and you keep the rest of them to go home to put on your regular race car. Got it. So it, it, it's uh, now, if and I know we have some Canadians on the call today, uh, and we obviously have Japanese, Australian, British, uh, French, everywhere else participants that are that are generally veterans. We do not ship decals overseas or to Canada because they just don't seem to ever make it. Uh, and we will we bring those to our Canadian friends and the others uh, at uh, uh, in Kentucky if if they're not in the uh, spring run. Thank you for that, Jeff. Okay, let's move on to talking about the roles of the driver and navigator. And so we'll start with driving 101. And uh, Steve, take it away. Okay, so my drivers out there, you'll hear the joke that drivers are stupid. 
But the reason for that is because the ability to hold an exact speed on that speedometer is hard. Uh, it requires a the ability to scan uh, with your peripheral vision what's going on around you. You can't focus 100% on the speedometer and you can't focus 100% on the road. You have to be able to divide your attention between the instrument and the highway. That's why when you get your speedometer, you want to mount it as high as you can so it's in your field of vision as you're looking out. Um, when you make your performance chart and you find out how quickly your car goes from 0 to 30 or 0 to 35, and how quickly it goes from 35 to zero, your navigator is using those numbers to calculate uh, when they can take you out at a start. Uh, we'll cover that later. But the trick is that you have to drive the car the same way every time. You don't have to drive it at wide open throttle to make those numbers. You just have to be consistent with it. So when you go out and practice, how long does it take me to go from zero to 30? You are going to uh, drive it in such a way that your car can do that um, and do it the same way every time. I try to leave a little uh, margin for uh, extra power in case I'm on a hill or something like that. And the uh, the speeds, you know, if, particularly if you have a car with like an open exhaust or uh, it's a little louder, it's much easier to hold your speed and rate of speed increase by listening to what the car sounds like. Uh, you'll develop those techniques on your own, but it's important at some point to go out and find out just exactly what your car will or will not do. Um, the, um, ah, navigators. Um, the driver cannot compensate for what he thinks is too slow or too fast. That's the navigator's job. Uh, if you've gone too far at a higher speed and you have to get back to the speed you're supposed to be, it's easiest if the driver can slow down the same amount that they went faster and hold that for as much time as you think you were off that speed. This is the precision driving part of it. Um, the uh, You can't guess that well, I think I'm going slower than 35 and I need to speed up to like 37. Don't do that. Because if you do, your navigator's got nothing to work with. You're, you're just guessing and the navigator can't work with those numbers. You just need to be precise, repeatable performance. If you're drag race fans back in the day when we used to have ET brackets, where you can bring any car to the drag strip, you get your speed dialed in on qualifying runs. And then every time you run in competition, you're trying to get as close to that same speed as you can. And the person who gets closest to that speed wins the race. It's kind of how this works. The, uh, uh, oh, visualize the course ahead. This is really important. Uh, it's something that you learn in aviation for one thing is you want to be looking not at the speedometer and not at the hood ornament. You want to be looking down the road. Look, you know, when you can, look farther ahead. See if there's a tractor pulling out ahead of you or a school bus that looks like it's going to stop and turn its red lights on. Or there's a green truck that looks like it's going to pull out of the field and start to pull over. You can make adjustments on your time and your speed if you give your navigator enough time to react to it. Uh, so your navigator is not looking down the road like you are. You know, the navigator is looking at the, uh, the charts and for the signs that you're going to be making your turns and maneuvers on. So when it comes to something as a driver, you look and say, well, gosh, there's a train over there on the left side. I don't know if it's going to cross here or not, but let your navigator know we could have a problem. So the navigator can figure out how to handle that problem. We'll cover that later. And um, making sure that you're physically prepared, I'm primarily talking about hydration. Uh, those of us who get older uh, find that uh, during the course of the day, you can get a little foggy uh, in your brain operation. Uh, and and uh, I like to use chewing gum. They help me uh, keep 
things sharp, uh, hydrate as much as you can, realizing that uh, you also have to deal with the results of hydration at some point. You know, we're going to give you plenty of potty stops, but uh, that becomes an issue too. Uh, and then, but make sure you're in good physical shape as well. Um, if you are basically sedentary and and um, you go into this event, there is a lot of of stress. There is a lot of lack of sleep. Um, there is, all, you know, just you, you want to make sure you're in the best physical shape that you are, so that you can uh, you can perform well, be have clarity of mind. Um, especially for the for the navigators so that you'll be, you'll be able to focus because you've got to be focusing basically for 10 hours straight. You, you just can't let up. So um, just make sure you're in good physical shape. And if you need to start hitting the gym between now and June, do it. The average leg is about an hour and a half. So you need to be able to drive in the car for an hour and a half. Uh, one of the things I do is I bring extra glasses uh, and leave them in the car. If you should break them or lose them or leave them at a restaurant, the last thing you want to do is trying to squint looking at the speedometer, trying to, so anything, uh, drugs, uh, anything that you need to have with you, um, that kind of stuff, uh, just keep it in mind and be ready for it. Okay, let's talk about the navigator's role. Um, so um, generally, you've got a lot of equipment that, that you're dealing with. I have a lap board that you can see a picture of. It's got all of my stuff. It's got my performance chart on it. Um, well, it's, it's a real pretty picture there on, on the screen. Um, so it's got my clock. It's got my performance chart. I've got my uh, stopwatch handy. I've got it Velcroed to the... Um, to the lap board so that I can pick it up and put it down and not lose it. Um, most, most navigators just wear it around their neck. And so it's handy to grab with your, your hand anytime you need it. Uh, your time of day clock, uh, recommend that you have one that has a sweep second hand. Um, and preferably the, the, the second hand itself is very close to the face of the clock. So you're not seeing any parallax because you're relying on those seconds and half seconds. If you've got one that is calibrated with, with mar markings for each individual second, that will be more accurate for you. Um, I've got uh, little clips that have pens and highlighters. Um, you're gonna have your start order that they give you at the end of each day for the following day that will have the list of uh, the cars and what order they will go out. So you will know what your start time will be. And then of course you'll have your, um, 30 to 50 pages of route instructions. So just make sure you've got a setup that's comfortable for you that you can see and that um, your driver can see it as, as well if they if there's any question about, you know, what does that intersection look like? There, there, there will be a, a visual diagram. And, and so if I'm trying to describe, well, it's kind of a five way and this goes to, you know, I can just point to it with my pen and say, you're looking for this. So you've got all that at your at your disposal. Okay, so um, then the next slide on the root instructions, um, you'll start with some nice, clean, beautiful root instructions. They'll have real pretty pictures of signs. Um, you are the arrow. So you'll start each root instruction. You are the dot at the arrow and it will show where you proceed through the, um, through the instructions. So you can see that the third one down, you're making a right turn. The others are just passing to the left of something that is on your right. So you'll see there's a crossroad sign, there is a right curve sign, there's a, a little squiggle sign. Uh, so that's that's how your root instructions start out looking nice and nice and pristine. And then by the end of the day, you've marked them up and made all kinds of notes to yourself and highlighted things. But we will go over that later on. But that that's basically what you're working with as the navigator. OK, so communication, this is the key thing. You're going to see a lot of these kinds of signs on the road and when you as the navigator are talking to your driver, you need to be able to communicate to them what they're looking for. So 
Um, that could be a right curve warning sign, or it could be a bare right, or it, but be you, whatever it is, you need to be able to, to know what your driver's talking, what, what your navigator is, is telling the driver. Uh, the next one, you could call that a hard left. You could call that a 90 degree left. You could call that a dead man left, um, but make sure you're using the same words each time. Um, side road to the left. Um, double dead man, uh, hard left chair, any any um, any combination of things, but make sure you're you're using the same words and understanding what that means. The last one could be called a snake, it could be called a squiggle, it could be called a multiple curved road up ahead. Um, and there's actually two versions of that. That one is a left right left, as opposed to a right left right. So um, just know that you will see both. And Janet, yes, on that sign that the the squiggly that starts to the left at the bottom, mm -hmm. there are squigglies that start to the right at the bottom, but it is not our intention. This came up last year. It is not our intention to trick you. If you see that sign and it's in the other direction, starting at the bottom, you still do the maneuver. It is, it is not, we do not, this is not a trick rally. We don't know, not a trap rally. Uh, this did come up last year. There was an instance where it, it went one way and it, in reality, and we had it the other way, even though we did four course runs, we, you know, we did miss it. 95% of the teams did it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> We did. Uh, there were two or three teams that did not do it correctly, and they were very good teams because they were looking for the correct sign. We, they, over the years, we've kind of tried. We've we've we kind of outsmarted ourselves in a way. Uh, the intention is not to trick anyone. Just wanted to clarify that. Okay, uh, and let's go on to some great race etiquette. Steve's going to tell us a little bit about what to expect and and. How to make the best of it. So you're going to be out on the course with a number of cars and a number of people of varying skill levels. There are some people who take it very seriously and they're looking for that big check. Uh, there are some folks that think that it's just out here for fun. They have paid their money and they're going to do it in whatever way they think they'd like to and they could get in the way of the people who are trying to win. Um, don't be that person. Yeah. What we're trying to do here is, is run your own race, do what you think you need to do to stay on course and on time. Um, however, there might be circumstances under which, um, if, you, if, if you're driving along at say 45 and everybody else is doing 50, you might've done something wrong. And you might be in people's way. The cars are spaced at one minute apart. So when you're going slow, the cars are close together. When you're going fast, you can hardly see each other. There's plenty of room within that minute to maneuver back and forth. Um, the uh, if a couple of things just to keep in mind: if you're doing something that's going to make it harder for somebody else, maybe you shouldn't be doing that. Um, and there are occasions when some teams like to start their day from a dead stop in the middle of the road. We don't recommend that, but you can't tell them not to do that. Um, it's uh, some of the roads, there's no traffic and it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but in other cases, um, there can be things where uh, you're lined up for a start at one of those signs and you have five or six cars waiting for their turn to leave. If the car in front doesn't have to leave for like 10 minutes, he's in everybody's way behind him. Uh, there's a lot of examples of this. These are minor issues, but they're just, as a rookie, you don't wanna be the guy that the other people complain about during the day. Uh, still run your own race, still do the thing that you're, you think you need to do, and if it becomes an issue uh, during the race, you know, come to us, come to Jeff or any of the other racers, particularly if they have an E next to their name as expert, just ask them the question, what do I do in circumstances like that? 
everybody will help you out. Everybody's right. been a rookie. Everybody's made mistakes. Everybody has blocked somebody else on the race course. Don't get mad at them. Uh, don't get mad with your teammate. It's let it slide off and um, uh, just try to be a, a good citizen while still being competitive. I know that sounds difficult, but regardless. Um, spectators and fans. One of the things you'll find as you're running along the road is that when you get 120, 130 cars passing a single point one minute apart, it's going to attract spectators. So there's plenty of time for them to call their buddies on their phone and they come out, they set up lawn chairs alongside the road and they wave at you and you can wave and be, you can smile, you know, and, and be polite. Um, sometimes when you're at a stop sign and you're ticking down seconds before you have to leave, somebody will come up and say, hey, where are you guys going? Uh, <laughs> you just wave your hand and say, hi, sorry, we're busy and uh, take off. You don't want that distraction during the race. When you're off the clock, spend as much time as you can talking to the folks that come out and see the race. They may want to do it at some point. Um, same with the press. Uh, you know, the, I've had plenty of times when uh, reporters have come up to me in these little towns that the local newspaper wondered if they could ask some questions. Um, I'm happy to do that. If you're not the kind of person that wants to do that, I, you say, you know, I'm sorry, but you see that guy over there uh, with the studio baker? He can talk to you. He can answer your questions. You be, be polite because uh, the intensity of the competition can get to you. And you don't want to snap at anybody or, or or seem rude while you're doing it. Spectators can also mess you up. Um, one of the things that we like about having spectators along the side of the road is that we know we're on the right road. Yeah. We call them great race people. And if there's people on the side of the road waving at you, you smile and say, yeah, we're on the right road. Yay. Lawn chair people, lawn chair people. Thank you. <laughs> if suddenly you don't see anybody anymore, you might have missed something. Uh, so they can be a help in that part. Uh, they can also be a distraction. Uh, I've had cases where the people would be at the side of the road at an intersection and say, everybody else went that way. And your navigator is telling you to go this way. Guess which one you're going to listen to most of the time. All of the time. All of the time. Um, because you could be in a maze. And amazes when the, the course loops back on itself. And at some point, the car is going to uh, turn left or or turn right at the very same intersection. So but, someone's trying to be helpful and they're really not. Yeah, but but you'll figure that out as you go along. Um, but they can they can distract you from, you know, if you're looking at a group of people on the left that are shouting and waving and the sign that you want is on the right, you could miss that sign and get off course. Ask me how I know that. Um, we did that on the last day of competition last year, and it cost us probably two places and maybe a couple thousand dollars. Yep, that it can happen. So um, the the uh, keep in mind where you're supposed to be, one minute apart from your other cars. Uh, be polite with the other racers and the spectators along the way. And then when you get in at the end of the night and you have a beer, you can talk about the jerk that pulled off in front of you and, <laughs> and cut you off. All right, let's go ahead and talk about your speedometer calibration now. As the slide changes there. There it is. It's yours. Is it? Okay. It is. Uh, the TimeWise speedometer uses a magnetic pickup. You put two blue two magnets on the left front wheel, uh, equidistant apart, uh, set up a, uh, a probe so it's adjustable so that you can pick up the signal as the magnet goes by. And then you power the speedometer with a 12 volt power source. Some people like to use separate batteries. I like to put mine into the uh, electrical system of the car itself. Uh, that depends on your car and how you like to do things like that. Because I can tell you people who uh, power their speedometers with a separate battery so they don't have to cut into the wiring system on their car, at some point, they will forget to charge it overnight. And I've seen that happen, too. Uh, the time-wise, uh, I'm going to try this and see if it works. Uh, let's see if I can get it in focus. And, and, well, this is, this is the rig I use to mount the time-wise 
on the uh, on the car. The because it's a, a 60s car, it has a small mast uh, for the steering, and I'm just using a, a regular U clamp on that with a piece of rubber on it to hold it in place. Then on the other end, I have a, a large uh, uh, high gear style clamp that the speedometer goes into and holds it in place. Just focus, you stupid thing. <laughs> Let me get it back here somewhere. Anyway, the idea is that the way I have this design is so it will stick up above the dashboard and it's in my line of sight uh, without having to make any modifications on the car itself. Yeah. It's the light reflection of it, I think. But anyway, you also need to be able to take your speedometer out because at the beginning of the day, you're going to be setting your uh, factor and you're going to have numbers. I don't know if you can read it on here or not, but the sticker on the back says, yeah, maybe up here. If you guys, That's you might number. turn off your blur background and that might. Just did. Oh, perfect. Oh, there you go. Hey, perfect. Now we're talking. You can see I've got a, a, a sticker on the back that says, up. Oh, that makes a big difference because if it's upside down and you turn those dials, you're going to be in real trouble and ask me how I know that. But you have to be able to take the speedometer itself out of the holder so that when you're parked on the side of the road, you can take this out, flip it around, use your little jeweler screwdriver. And when the navigator tells you what your factor is, you dial that into the back of the speedometer. So wherever you mount it, you have to be able to get to it. Also, if you forget, uh, like if you have the, if it's powered to the car and you turn the car off before it stops rolling, this needle will be wherever you pull the plug on it. So when you restart, your speedometer will be off. This face unscrews and you can push that needle back to zero point. One of the things you want to check before you take off is that the speedometer is actually at zero before you leave. Okay, Hank Mull has just given us a really great suggestion in the uh, in the comments. I removed the back plate of the speedometer and enlarged the holes to the adjustments to make it easier to see and calibrate. That's a really good idea. I'm gonna do that. Because I've been afraid to take that thing apart. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. It's a great idea. Okay, so speedometer adjustments. Go on to the next slide. And this is what you'll be doing during the race. When you run the speedometer calibration part of the uh, each day, um, you will find out whether you are either early or late based on uh, the rally master's calibration. So you run the, when you first get there, um, they'll give you a measured mile, which is basically a speedometer calibration run. And uh, it might only be 10 or 15 minutes worth, and then you come back the opposite direction. It's always, it's generally run on an interstate. You're running at 50 miles an hour, and then you're just looking to see what the uh, the signs are along the way. And then you will have a, a totally lapsed time that you're trying to match. So um, you have the opportunity to adjust your speedometer as many times as you need to, to try to lock that in until you do match. Um, the factor is the, the four numbers on the back. If you're running early, you need to increase that factor. If you're running late, you need to decrease that factor. So what you do is you they give you the correct time and you have your actual time. You need to convert that into total seconds. So total time uh, of the correct time divided by your actual time in seconds times the factor will give you the new factor to plug into your uh, speedometer. You can do that with a calculator as long as you are not on the race. So when you when you set up your uh, your measured mile ahead of time, when you get to Owensboro, you can use your calculator for that to, to just lock it in. But each day during the race, you're going to be doing that adjustment manually. So um, once you have the factor locked in, you take that number, divide it by 3,600, and that gives you the number of clicks for each second per hour that you are either early or late. In our case, it's 1.13 clicks per second. So um, I know that I will have to um, 
if I'm eight seconds late, I'm going to do nine clicks. But otherwise, if I'm five seconds late, I'm going to do five clicks and, and so forth. And then you'll just um, convert your earlier late time into seconds, multiply it times that single click factor, and then you'll just do that number of clicks on your speedometer itself. And just to add, when you get the speedometer, you're going to be given a, a instruction sheet, which shows you how to do the initial setup. You'll mark a spot on, with your tire on the ground, and you'll give the wheel a complete revolution all the way around, measure the distance that it's traveled, and that's your initial setup on this. So it's very much set to the size of your tire. Uh, and if you have to replace the tire during the race, you'll ne obviously need to recalibrate this. Um, secondly, because these holes are small and Hank Mole makes a really uh, good suggestion, I keep a small flashlight in the center console of the car so that I can illuminate the wheel on the inside. You can't even see it this way, but it's white. Uh, it has seven clicks on it, I believe. Ten. Ten? Goes Whatever. One through zero. Okay, well, fine. Yeah, that's not my job. <laughs> and um, I have a small flashlight that I keep with the jeweler screwdriver to make that adjustment so I can see inside and make sure that I have it exactly right. One click off, and your 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 next leg is is not good. All right, let's go into the next. We want to make sure that we have enough time to go through the instructions and uh, take your questions at the end. So, um, hey Janet, could I say one more thing on the speedometers to the yes? Room? Oh, my suggestion to you is unplug your speedometer when you're going five miles an hour. And then you'll find out because everybody freaks out and goes, how do I fix this? All you got to do is unscrew the, the bezel, long winded thing, take it off with your finger, turn the speedometer dial clockwise up to the top again. That's all there is to it. It's not that hard. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. All right, let's go on to creating a performance chart. This is something that you're going to be relying on very heavily. Um, so what we recommend, just the basics. You just need to know the basics of how long, how many seconds you lose for accelerating, decelerating, and turning at each speed between basically 15 and 50 miles an hour. So we recommend you find a straight level section of road about a half mile long. If you can do a full mile, um, that's even better. Um, preferably with little or no traffic, and uh, you'll need to be able to turn around safely at the uh, each end of the course and also have enough time to accelerate up to 50 miles an hour before the, the start of your course. So again, you're going to be doing that at different speeds, making frequent stops. Um, so you want something that takes about 40 seconds to um, to traverse at 50 miles an hour. And you'll just mark each end of the course with a marker like an orange traffic cone or a stick with a flag on it. Um, and if you're running the lower speeds, you can do a much shorter run just to save time because you really don't want to be out there for a minute and a half. It's the longest minute and a half of your life um, going 10 miles an hour. Um, and then you'll run that course entering at those various speeds, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, and 50, over and over and over and over. Um, you want to do at least four runs at each speed, record the times. Um, so that's entering at that speed, maintaining that speed through the course, and then um, exiting at that speed. So that becomes your base. So um, you kind of average the, the four or five runs that you've done so you know what your, your base length of time to go through that, um, that course is. Then you're going to um, determine how to ex uh, get your acceleration loss, your deceleration loss, and your turn loss. So we'll go to the next screen for that. And yes, um, Bram, you should calibrate your speedometer as close as you can before you do the performance chart, because that's just gonna make it as accurate as possible. So now that you've got your base numbers, you start from a stop at the start line, and then you accelerate up to that speed and finish at that speed through the course. So again, do this four or five times, 
and um, you know, hit your um, hit your stopwatch when you get to the end, and you you should see a fairly consistent number um, for that acceleration loss when you compare it to your base time, and so that will give you your acceleration loss. Can I jump in for a sure. second? For those of you who are going to be using riddle cars in Michigan, same process. It doesn't have to be a specific distance between your two points. Just get out there with your factory speedometer, which is probably on a modern car. It's probably electronic, and it's probably fairly accurate. And get out there and see if holding 50 between your two points uh, actually comes out correct on your time. Uh, what's the uh, well, the lap's time at 50, you will only know that after practicing it a for, for times. exact mile, but they're not going to measure out of miles to do no, no, you that don't need to. it's not important. All you need to do is establish something that is at 50 or 30 or whatever it is, find out that time, then find out how long it takes you to stop at a complete stop, then go again. But you use the same procedure if you have a time wise or if you're using the factory speedometer in the car. Okay, so now you've got your acceleration loss. Your next one that you're going to do is this. Oh, go back, go back. Um, the next one you're going to do is a stop and go. So you're entering the course at speed. So back, back one more. Yes, yeah, stay there. Um, start, start through at speed, and then you do an immediate stop and immediate um, acceleration back to speed. And if you can do that two or three times within your course then you'll, you'll be able to average out the loss. So say you had three stop and goes within that course, then um, you could just compare that to your base and the difference, say the difference was 15 seconds. Then you divide that by the number of stop and goes you did, which is three. So now you know that your loss at that speed is five seconds for a stop and go. You already know what your acceleration loss was. So you subtract your acceleration loss from your stop and go, and now you have your deceleration loss. So you've kind of done two at once that way. Um, now the um, procedure for doing turns, we recommend that as you're trying to do consistent driving skills for the drivers that Every time you do a turn that you brake and uh, get down to a speed of 15 miles an hour at the turn and then accelerate out to your out speed. So if every turn you make, you slow down to 15 and then accelerate, it's going to be a consistent number for you as far as your time loss. That will help your navigator. So in, in working on your performance chart, you enter at speed. And then when your navigator tells you, break down to 15 miles an hour and then back up to the speed. And same thing, if you can do it three or four times during your um, during your course, then that, that will just help you to finish your process a little bit more quickly. So again, the... Um... <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm reading the notes in the margin. <laughs> so again, if you've made like three or four runs, you just um, divide it by the number of uh, the the loss at each speed. And just for driver technique, when I do a stop and go, when I stop the car, I wait until the car rocks back. That's when you're stopped. Because if you're just coming down to three or four miles an hour and you hit it again, that's not a consistent measurement. But if you wait till the car stops and rocks, then you're stopped. So there's a really good question in the margin. And this is probably not a rookie level answer. Um, I actually have on my chart, it's an Excel spreadsheet. And it shows the percentage of difference between each of the speeds. Uh, so I, I have one one set factor for a 30 to 30 and a 40 to 40 and a 35 to 35. And then the 30 to 50 is a certain percentage of that. And, and so it's a it's a mathematical calculation. Um let's let's just that's hard. Let's just get to just the go point. down to 15 and then correct three seconds. You guys are rookies, and rookies are your goal is to finish within your minute. Um 
Seconds come later. But if you can finish within your minute, close as you can, you're going to score well. And that's how you start this deal. The advanced stuff goes to the point where uh, everybody has their own way of doing these fractions of seconds. That's not your concern. Your concern is staying on course and staying in your minute. Concentrate on that. And these techniques will get you through that just fine. And so you can see when we started out, we had a performance chart that looked like the chart on the left. We now have a performance chart that after 25 years that looks like the chart on the right. You are fine with the chart on the left. You will do great. We won rookie with that chart on the left. So you can do that too. All right, let's go on to the next one. Support crews. There we go. Um, support crews are awesome. Um, not every team has the privilege or joy of having a support crew. Um, we've probably, again, over the 25 years, we've had a support crew maybe six or seven of those years. And uh, otherwise, we are kind of doing it all on our own. It makes a huge difference. If you have family, friends, um, you know, car club members that want to experience the great race, people that think, oh, great race would be something fun to do maybe, but I'd like to find out more about it. Well, how would you like to be our support crew? And then they'll get hooked. Right, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you don't need a support crew for the Michigan race. You'll be coming back to the same hotel each night. And it's really helpful when you're traveling halfway across, oh, oh, all the way across the continent like we did last year and then and having we'll be doing again this year and Thank doing you. again this year uh we will having a team that can take your truck and trailer and haul your uh luggage luggage and check you in at the hotel and do stuff like that is great when you're at the end of the day and you're tired um but it's not necessary if you're going to a regional rally which is one of the big pluses of doing that and secondly, you know, if you have a big enough car and you have two guys that are, you know, not carrying a lot of luggage and stuff like that, and you know how much gear you bring with you uh, for tools like jacks and things like that that you may need overnight to fix something, uh, the support crew can be really helpful. The support crews have their own set of instructions for getting from this day to the next day, um, which are assigned. And they're not on the race course at any time. In fact, you can have, be disqualified if your support crew is on the race route when you're on a time section. Um, so that's something that let your potential support crew guys know that you'll be able to go around and look at anything you want, stop at other places. Sometimes they have organized uh, venues for you to go to, take a leisurely lunch while your team is out working their butts off out in the field somewhere. But uh, a support crew, if you can get one, is really helpful. Okay. Uh, next one, what to pack? Next. Okay. So um, expect all kinds of weather. We have rallied in brutally hot off this thermometer uh, heat. We have had rain. Um, there will be hot and humid. There will be thunderstorms. There will be um, snow. No, we had snow. Uh, and you know, if you're in an open speedster, you're just going to have to have a full-on rain suit, and you're going to have something plastic to cover your route instructions with, so that um, they don't get so wet. Um, had a hurricane once. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so just be prepared for anything pack accordingly. Um, again, if you're in an open car, you'll need sun protection. So pack lots of, of quality sunscreen. Um, Great Race does give you a hat. You may need a little bit more than that. Um, make sure you've got drinking water in a cooler inside your car and replenish it each day. Uh, as I mentioned before, a uh, navigator may want to take pictures. You're not going to have access to your cell phone. So get a digital camera. You can you can pick up a cheap one at Best Buy or or, or Walmart or wherever. Um, but make sure that you've um, you've got the ability to to take pictures during the day. You're going to want to have those memories. 
Um, Great Race will be selling you merchandise. Um, they will provide each driver and navigator with an event t-shirt and a hat. They all have other shirts. You will love their other shirts. They're so cool. So um, pack fewer shirts than you think you'll need. And, and sometimes we've even had some of our overnight stops and lunch stops give us shirts. They give us goodie bags with free stuff. So um, pack, pack fewer than what you need. Um, again, it, if you have a support crew and they're willing to do your laundry and you're willing to let them do your laundry, you can pack fewer things as well. Um, one creative team has suggested that you buy cheap underwear and throw them away each night. Okay. Um, we have seen a team bring one set of clothes and wash them in the hotel sink every night. Um, that was also the team that was changing out their um, drive shaft during on the side of the road <laughs> because they filled their car with all the extra parts Got it instead of luggage. Don't be that team. Uh, there are lots of stops at gas stations um, with mini marts. If you need to pick up essentials, you'll see lots of Walmarts and auto parts stores all along the way. Um, okay, now I have a question here. Uh, is a GoPro camera allowed? Because you generally will run that GoPro camera with your phone, I'm guessing probably not. And I'm going to ask Jeffrey Houston to, to uh, weigh in on that one. Uh, yes, actually, GoPro cameras are allowed and encouraged. Uh, oh, okay, they're great. Uh, if, if 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 your phone is not in the car, GoPro cameras. Uh, in fact, the the best video we ever got was Scott Henderson saving that team yeah. from going over the cliff at at uh, Mount Washington. Uh, uh, with his GoPros were mounted on his car, so it, you're you're absolutely fine with uh, a GoPro, as long as you're not using any of that. I don't even know. I didn't even know about how it works with a phone. As long as you're not using your phone to just you set it up, let GoPro it run. App and you turn it on and off with your phone. But the phone I doesn't have to be go. in the car for the GoPro to work. I'm in the car, meaning you can be in the trunk. And not yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. And, and just turn it on, let it run. No, great. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, and again, under what to pack car parts, only what you can fix or replace on the side of the road. Um, and, and Basic again. hand tools. If there's anything that you need a special tool for, you know, like the haze, uh, where you may need a special tool to adjust the points or something like that, make sure you have those tools because you're not picking those up at Napa. Uh, but otherwise, uh, lots of people have bought uh, tools. You'll have time after the end of the day on your way to the hotel to stop by an auto parts store or during the race itself they put in breaks there's a lunch break there's potty breaks there's gas breaks sometimes you can pick up stuff in the gas station uh sometimes you have enough time on your lunch break to stop by uh, an auto parts store to pick up some coolant or extra oil or something like that so it while the time is limited it's not uh, it's not finite. I mean, you can you, you'll be able to uh, get what you need pretty quickly, unless you need tires. Tires are a problem because when you get in at the end of the day, the tire stores are all closed, and when they don't open early enough for you to go and get tires before the race starts. And we have stories about that, but we'll save that for another time because we need to move on. So when you arrive in Owensboro, um, go ahead to the next slide. Um, so Wednesday, uh, teams will arrive. There may be some host town special events. Um, it's a great opportunity to meet with your uh, mentor teams. Um, and if you're a mentor, to meet up with your rookies. Um, Thursday will be registration and vehicle inspection. Jeff just sent out the schedule so that you know um, what time you are expected to um, to be at the registration area and uh, to get your uh, your tech inspection done. And uh, then again, you'll have the opportunity to pick up your t-shirt and hat and purchase additional merchandise. They'll give you your measured mile for the speedometer calibration. And then uh, you can just kind of go hang out in the parking lot, check out everybody else's cars and- um, Introduce yourselves. Yeah. You know, the rookies so get to know each other. Uh, that what we did, we had a rookie class the year that we started in the big race in 2000. And uh, we stayed friends up until, you know, over the years, people had, you know, dropped out. But you have a special bond with the other rookies that started out the same time you did. Um, 
Steve and Janet, uh, I get asked uh, uh, regularly, and we will the actual schedule of events for the Great Race will come out this Thursday in the newsletter. Oh, great! But awesome. Just if you can, you should arrive in Owensboro on Wednesday. The opening reception will be that evening at Green River Distillery in Owensboro. It's a neat place. And then Thursday is very active with registration, tech inspection. Just to be clear, the time you were given is the time that you arrive at registration. You go through registration. It should only take 10 minutes or so. You might want to spend 10 minutes buying some souvenirs. And then you will immediately take your car outside of the registration area at the convention center to the parking lot. It'll be very obvious where it is, where all the great race tents are set up for tech inspection. So a lot of a lot of rookies always ask me, oh, uh, is that my time for registration or tech? Both. It's your time to go to registration. That time, if you were, if you were 11.04 a.m., that means you should be in the registration room at 11.04 a.m., 11.04 a.m., go through that, immediately take your car, and go through tech inspection right after. If you do everything correctly, if your paperwork is all done, and I say paperwork, it's all electronic now, if that is all completed, they'll push you in and out of registration pretty quick, get you out to tech inspection, and then you can be on your way doing all the other things like the measured mile, getting your speedometer dialed in, and things like that. Uh, the people of Owensboro are also throwing a barbecue on that Thursday from 11.30 to 2.30. It's going to be a lot of fun to a good southern uh, barbecue where they actually cook the barbecue in 55-gallon drums where they cut them in half and make their own mm. make their own barbecue things. It's, it's a very popular thing in the South. So uh, you want to arrive, if you can, by, uh, you know, in Owensboro by Wednesday uh, uh, afternoon. Got it. Thank you, Jeff. All right, then let's go on to a day in the life of a great race team. So before your day starts, um, you will know your race start time the previous day. Uh, it will be on your instructions um, at the end of the instructions for the day. So you'll know what the race start time is. You'll know what your starting position is because they will give you that order of start that will list uh, it will have the race start time. It'll tell you what uh, what position you're going to be in, who you're going to be following. And then uh, you will also know uh, from the previous day's instruction what hotel you'll be picking up your instructions from. It will not always be the hotel you are staying at. So you will need to know on the previous day how to get to that hotel that you're picking up the instructions from in the morning and what time to be there. Um, so you'll determine what your start time is, you'll have breakfast, and you kind of work all this backwards. It's like, I know I need to be at this hotel at this time, so this is when we're going to have breakfast, this is when we're going to meet our support crew to hand off our luggage, or, you know, pack it in the car. Um, this is when we're going to, uh, you can set your clock and stopwatch in your hotel room, but you're going to want to recheck it when you get to um, where they hand out the instructions and um, pick up your course instructions 30 minutes before your start time. And um, the important thing is, you know, they, they do the best that they can to make sure that the instructions are absolutely accurate, but they will have a team that will go through the day before and also one very early that morning that will determine if there is any emergency construction that's going on, any road closures, any flooding, anything that makes the, the route unsafe. And they will um, give you emergency instructions. They'll be taped on the window of the car where the, uh, where the clock is, and they will also be handed out to you at registration. But you want to make sure that you pick those up and, and uh, make sure that you've looked through them and made those adjust, adjustments in your course instructions. And then you'll start marking them up and um, then you'll be on your way. So that's before your day starts. Now, the next section, next slide. On the road, go ahead, dear. Oh, the race gives you a uh, speedo calibration run every morning 
do not assume that your factor from the previous day, even if you won the previous day, is going to be the same the next day. So you will have your navigator will have her course instructions, which will give you a route that you'll run at exactly 50 miles an hour unless otherwise told. Signs along the side, you click the stopwatch, see if your elapsed times are close or the same or determine if you need an adjustment. That's gonna happen every day and you need to do it every day. The um, uh, check your order of start. As a driver, you wanna know the cars that are supposed to be in front of you and behind you on that day. Gonna change every day. So you wanna know that the car two ahead of you, the black Ford Roadster that's two ahead of you has an E next to their name. So they are experts. So you can get a pretty good idea as a rookie when you're supposed to be lined up for the start because that guy's exactly two minutes ahead of you. Um, and then that, through the course of the day, unless somebody gets off course, uh, you're going to be holding that position with those cars for the rest of the day. Next day, it changes. Um, the um, lunch, uh, checkpoints. Is it time to do checkpoints? Um, briefly. Very briefly. Your score is determined by how accurately you reproduce the time that it took from the start to the checkpoint. That is controlled by the rally master. You don't know what that is. So when you see a checkpoint coming up, there'll be a green sign on the side of the road. You usually can see it as the driver before the navigator will figure it out. You tell your navigator the checkpoint's coming up so she can make the stopwatch. But you wanna hold your speed uh, and make sure that the speed that you're supposed to be at at the next section is what you're like. If you think you're running late, you're trying to make up time. When you cross that checkpoint, you got to get back to the speed that you're supposed to be because that's the immediate start of the next section. You don't do anything else. You don't stop. You don't talk to the checkpoint workers. You don't ask them any questions. You just drive right through it like it's not there. Uh, the, what, what you will hear is them going, Mook. and that's for the navigator. So she can mark down the time. That's but, when you get your count, your stopwatch out and you look at the time of day and you write that down in the margin on your route instructions. You're going to do that a couple of times before you get to lunch, uh, depending on, uh, on the course. Uh, lunchtime, they give you enough time to have a decent lunch. I wouldn't say it's leisurely. Uh, but you don't have to wolf it down and try to get out to the restart and be there 30 minutes ahead of when you're supposed to be there. You follow the instructions. Uh, sometimes there's not enough room for everybody to be out there. And you want to make sure that you get something to eat and drink, use the bathroom and all that stuff. They give you plenty of time for that, so you don't have to rush it. Same thing when you're on the road. Uh, uh, supposedly, you filled your car up with gas before you left that morning. If you didn't, you know, you're going to have to figure out when and where you can fill up during the race. Sometimes they will tell you, get gas here because the next stop's uh, 120 miles or whatever it is. All cars are different in terms of their fuel capacity and range. You have to know your car and what you can get done. Um, at the end of the day, when you get to your final checkpoint and you can, uh, you can relax, there'll be a transit from your final checkpoint to where the race ends. There will be a formal gate that you'll go through. Sometimes you get one for lunch, but you always get one at the end. And you can see the gate in the picture uh, in the slide where uh, you will be given your score by John and then they will park your car and you will be in what's called a park for me for an hour and a half or however much time they've determined that you're gonna be there. That's important. You can't go to the hotel, you can't go to the tire store unless you have permission from the race director to be able to do that because they have sold that city that they were going to have 130 cars on display for an hour and a half. And you need to be a part of that. You can't leave until the time is up. And you'll know because everybody will fire up engines. It'll be like the Indy 500 and everybody's heading for the hotel. Sometimes you can get dinner uh, while you're uh, waiting during the show. It's great to talk to the people who come out and see you, I had a car just like this, except it was a Chevy and it was yellow. And uh, all the stories that you'll get, which is a lot of the fun. And then sometimes dinner will be hosted. 
and the city will tell you where to go to find your hosted dinner. Uh, that, that, that can vary day to day, but that's kind of the way it works. You have your morning where you're getting everything ready. You got your speedo calibration run. You run a couple of legs on time. You have a lunch break. You run a leg, have a potty stop, run a leg or two, and then get to the finish. And your score doesn't count until you get across the finish line at the end. So you're actually at the end of the day, you're not really done. You're just done for that day. You still have a time that you have to start the next morning. And like Janet said, you back up the clock and say, okay, if I have to be here at 730, how far is that hotel from where we're staying? Did I put gas in the car? Do I need to have that ready? Do I need to meet with my checkpoint or my support crew? Uh, and so for the every day of the race, your time is set. You, you know where you're going to be and where you're supposed to be there. All right. Let's go ahead and go through some sample course instructions. But first, we're going to talk about the four S's for success. I see what you did there. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Over the years, uh, people who have been doing this have come up with uh, a little acronym for how to prioritize the things that you need to do. This kind of comes out of aviation where uh, aviate, navigate, and communicate in that order are something that you were taught when you were first taught how to fly so that you keep your brain focused on what you need to do. This is the most important thing for rookies to keep in mind throughout their race. And veterans. Well, yeah, the veterans sometimes forget. Yeah. Safety first. You can get the bit in your teeth. You can get excited. You can get uh, flustered. You can get um, the adrenaline pumped up. And sometimes you'll do things that you wouldn't normally do on the road. When we were younger, we made a lot of great stories in Great Race. And we'll tell them to you over a beer sometime. Privately. This is not the time. Um, but, <laughs> but we every, would not do those now. No, because you keep in the back of your mind that as rookies, you've got throwout legs. So, you, you know, if you end up being stopped by a train and then there's another train and then there's another train, you know, okay, what the hell? We'll just throw that one out and we'll get to the next one and, and make a start. Um, or you're not, you see three school buses coming up on your left while you need to pull out for your start. You make two one to two decisions. One, I can pull out early and let my navigator figure out how to bleed off those seconds, or I can just wait until they go by and we'll know how late we are. And then we can, you know, we can file a time delay because we couldn't pull out in front of school buses. Same things happens if the school buses have their little red lights on you're not going to go and pass the school bus while the red lights are on. The rules of great race state that you must obey all traffic laws. That includes speeding. Uh, it also includes, uh, you know, running stop signs or running, you know, traffic signals. It's not worth it. Uh, you can figure out how to fix anything like that and stay safe and still be competitive. Um, starting on time, Single most important thing for a rookie to learn. When do I go? Because there is nobody on the course telling you that like a checkered flag or a green flag say, okay, go now. Uh, you're figuring that out on your own. It's going to be based on your performance chart, which tells you how long it takes to get from zero to 30, whatever your outspeed is. And your navigator is going to give you a countdown for when you should take off it will always be sooner than the actual time that you your start begins because you have to compensate for the time it takes to accelerate to that speed. Um, the uh, So if your clock is calculated, you've done your, your performance chart, your speedometer is pretty close or about right, that'll work every time. Some people will start from a dead stop, which is what we normally do. Some people will always do it on a rolling start where they come whipping past, turn around, come back, figure out how long that took. And the car that's supposed to be in front of you may be somebody doing a flying start. When you do a flying start, 
Um, this is great for low horsepower cars that need to get up to speed, especially if there's a hill ahead. Um, the uh, Mark, yes, it is frowned on. Yeah, well, the the idea being that you know how early you are or how late you are when you cross the sun, and you can make those adjustments later, but your car is up to speed and you're not dependent on if you got your the gear selection right or a horsepower or something like that. Um, staying on course is uh, as well as starting on time staying on course is the most important thing for everybody particularly rookies because if you get off course figuring out how to fix the time you've lost uh, makes it more difficult uh, sometimes staying on court the the root instructions are not designed to fool you or trick you or anything like that the street signs will be legible uh, they'll tell you which side of the street the sign is on, or if it's not a sign, you know, if it's the second paved road to the right, that doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. Uh, you just, both of you need to have your heads up looking for that. Now, as a driver, if you have to slow down to make sure that that's the right intersection, that's okay. If it's not right, speed up, go a little bit faster to make up for the time that you lost and go back. But don't lock up all four wheels and, and crank it over like, oh, my God, I have to make this turn right now. Uh, that doesn't usually work very well. But staying on course, even if you have to slow down a little bit to make sure you make the right turn, that makes sense. And then staying on time. Clearly, if you start on time and you do all the correct speeds and you stay reasonably on the course and your maneuvers are reasonably close, you're going to have a good day. Uh, so uh, just keep in mind that you're, you're constantly running slower than the course is telling you to run and you have to make up time, you know, every time you slow down or stop or anything like that. But uh, usually you can stay within your minute is very doable for rookies. Hey, right, Steve. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I want to jump in here and give the dirty little secret about the great race for all the rookies. This is the most important thing I think that's said here tonight. And this is especially for my friend, Peter Hersey, who is on this call, who's been a great racer for since the many years. Yeah. Huh? Many years. Now 20 plus years, but this will be his first time to really navigate in the entire great, great race. The instructions we give you, if you follow the instructions, if you start on time, stay on course, and follow the instructions, 90 to 95% of everything we give you is free. It's given to you. If we say go 40 miles an hour and you can go 40 miles an hour and it matches our 40 miles an hour, which is easy, all that is free. It's given to you. There's a lot of free time too, just getting to the certain start time so now we're down to only 5 to 10% of the entire race is actually handling turns, stop signs, the occasional tractor, what have you. So if you can start on time, stay on time, and follow the instructions, drive the speed we tell you to drive, right there you've, you've mastered 90 to 95% of the entire great race. Exactly right. All right, let's look at some course instructions so we can get an idea of what you're going to be looking at each day. So the root instructions will be in three sections. There'll be a tire warm up that'll just help you uh, to to warm up, uh, and you'll you'll see uh, in the column B that's the section that you're on. So you see the tire warm up. That's telling you that uh, you're you're going to be warming up your tires for, for however many miles and for how many minutes. And then uh, there will be a speedometer calibration. You see that down at the bottom of the page. You see that picture of that uh, analog speedometer. And um, then that will be uh, where the next section, uh, and then following the uh, speedometer calibration will be sequential timed instructions. And then there's four columns. The first column will show you the description of the road, the signage, the intersections that you're gonna be going through. Um, column B, again, is what section you're in. Column C is what speed and timing you're going to be dealing with. And then column D, don't ignore column D. There's a lot of special instructions, course notes that are very helpful to you. 
And then the other number one thing that you need to do when you pick up your root instructions, do not leave the table until you go through that entire thing. It says there's 13 pages in there. You make sure that all 13 pages are there and in the right order. It's, you know, you're dealing with a, a you know, a Kinko's or, or whoever that, that made that. And sometimes their machines slip a little bit. So you want to make sure that that is completely correct. All right, let's go to the next slide. This is the spinometer calibration. It started on the previous page and it told you what, um, what sign, it was a speed limit 65 sign. At that speed limit 65 sign, you're just gonna hit your, your uh, stopwatch and you're going to be at the speed that it told you to be at, which uh, was 50 miles an hour. So uh, it's, it's telling you that you're going to be uh, doing this for 24 miles and you're going to be, um, and it's going to take you 25 or 20 minutes, 25 minutes to, to do that. All right, so now we'll go on to the next page. Um, you are, again, you're the dot with the arrow showing you the direction that you're going to be going through. And so the first thing you're gonna see is a sign on the right that will say um, Kennebunkport. Uh, and so uh, in the third column, you'll see that the interval from where you started should be four minutes, 3.4 seconds. And your total elapsed cumulative time is the same because you've just been to one sign so far. And so that should correspond to your stopwatch, but write down in that right column, what time you have on your stopwatch. Now you're starting to look for the next sign, which you can see is in another three minutes and 16 seconds. Notice the arrow is now on the right, the sign is on the left. So you've got to orient yourself to whatever you see there. You know that you're going to be seeing, looking for a sign on your left in three minutes. Again, just hit the split time on your stopwatch. Don't hit stop and start. You're going to ruin everything. So hit the split time, write down your split time. Go on for another minute and 10 seconds. There will be another sign on your left. Then there will be another sign on your right. You just continue to hit that split and, and write it down. Uh, now you've got one where you're going underneath the sign. So obviously this sign is overhead. So it'll be on a bridge um, or it'll be on a, a sign that's hanging over the top um, and just continue to um, to just ch to ch tick those off as, as you pass them. And what you're looking for um, as you're writing down those times is to see if there's a steady progression of being early or late. So I'm looking at those and I'm, I'm comparing, um, say on the second one, I was at seven minutes, 17 seconds. Then, okay, I'm already two seconds early at seven minutes. And let's go on down to the University of New England. That's at 12 minutes, 55 seconds. If I'm at 12 minutes and 42 seconds, then I know I'm already 30, 13 seconds early. So um, you're, you're watching for a linear uh, difference in being early or late, and then um, you're going to be able to um, calibrate your speedometer or know how to, to make changes throughout the day based on that. Um, if for some reason you uh, hit the stop instead of the split on your stopwatch, you can always restart at the next sign. You're just going to have to do some math to change those elapsed times. Um, sometimes there's traffic and there you just you can't hold 50 miles an hour. Um, and again, you, you do the best you can with what you're given. Um, Generally speaking, what happens at 50 miles an hour is all the traffic pulls away from you. So you stay in the right lane, do your 50 miles an hour. People will honk at you. Sometimes that's friendly. Sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And uh, just motor along at 50 and the driver should keep their eye out in case that lane goes away. So you'll have plenty of time to transition into the next lane to the left and hold at 50. And uh, to, to Ken's uh, point, don't let the driver know, oh, we're running early, oh, we're running late, because then the driver will just mentally try to make up for that. You want the driver to be holding the indicated 50 miles an hour so that you will know exactly how much correction that you'll need to make at the end. And yes, the arrow does represent the car's position in reference to the sign. Okay, um, so continuing on to the next slide uh, with the overhead. So um, 
notice where it says there stay on I-95. That might be an indication that there's um, possibly a uh, an intersection with another freeway coming up. And so sometimes when he does that um, overhead sign, that is to indicate what lane you should be in. If that sign is not directly overhead, you are in the wrong lane. Okay. Um, and then it will also give you an idea of where um, where you're going to be exiting. So Payne Road, one half mile, that's telling you that that exit 45 is Payne Road. That's where your the end of your calibration is. You see the um, uh, sand, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Hourglass. 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 Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and so you see, we are now starting a transit. Again, that's the section of the root instructions that we're in. We're starting a transit. And so that has ended the calibration, uh, speedometer calibration section. You have a total um, that you're going to compare your elapsed time to their elapsed time so that you know that in 26 minutes, are you three seconds early? Are you 10 seconds late? And then that will inform what you're going to do to, um, to make that correction. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, so now you're in a transit. You're just following the instructions. Um, and if you are going to be making an actual change to your speedometer, don't do that right away because you, you might miss the instructions on where to turn and, and uh, make sure that you're in a safe place and stopped like a gas station or a parking lot or waiting for your start. And that's when you adjust your speedometer. Um, if you can't, if you're using a rental car, you won't be able to adjust your speedometer. You'll just be, know based on that time how many seconds you need to correct at what time, how often throughout the day. If you were uh, five seconds late in, in 25 minutes, then you're going to be one second late every five minutes. So you'll correct one second every five minutes for two seconds every 10 minutes, something like that. Okay. Okay. All right, so now we're continuing on. Let's go on to the next. Oh, this is a uh, a no-host uh, luncheon here. So um, that just kind of lets you know what, what's available to you. And, and you've got that uh, number in parentheses, that 10 minutes. That lets you know that at that point, you are 10 minutes away from your restart or from for your initial start for the day. And then it'll take you on down. You're going to be making a left turn at a signal. And now you are eight minutes away from your start. So let's go on to the next slide. And this is the scary one. You see that digital clock and that, that is your start. So you're just following the instructions to get to a stop ahead sign, which seems like a curious place to start at a stop ahead, but that is what you'll be doing. And you will know what your start time is based on your root instructions and your order of start. So um, if you're looking at your root instructions and you are car 32, and that is starting at 140, you would add 32 minutes to that and you would be starting at 212. And I, I'm not reading the, the one that's in there in the instructions because it's too small. Yeah. Um, but basically you're adding your start order to the time that's shown in that clock. And that is the, the time of day that you will be starting at. So car number one does not start at 140. Car number one starts at 141. Car number two at 142, car number 10 at 150, et cetera. And you will be going to 20 miles an hour at that stop ahead sign. So you know exactly what speed you're going to be starting out at. And you're going to be looking at that order of start to say, okay, we're now three minutes before our start. The car three in front of us is starting now. The car two in front of us, that's a Packard. Okay, he's right there. He's in line. Um, the car after that is a 32 Ford. Okay, they're right in front of us. And the car that's behind us is should be a Chrysler, oh, and there he is. Okay, so you know you're in the right place by looking at that order of start so that you can verify that you're where you need to be at the time you need to be. All right? So now you're just going to start following those instructions one by one by one by one. And if you see an instruction that says zero miles per hour, that will correspond to a stop. So obviously we're starting at a stop ahead sign, so you can expect your next instruction is going to be a stop. 
So you're going to be going from 20 miles an hour down to zero for that stop. And then after you stop, you're going to be going to 30, 30 miles an hour. 35. Um, 35. And um, it gives you 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 seconds for each stop. However, remember you lose time when you decelerate and you lose time when you accelerate. And so you're going to take those numbers that you've already created on that performance chart and you're going to adjust that 15 seconds accordingly. So in this particular case, he's at 10.2. That means he loses a total of 4.8 seconds in decelerating and accelerating. So you're going to hold only for 10 seconds. So as soon as you rock back, the um, navigator is going to tell you going to 35 in 10 nine, eight, seven, six, that's faster than what would be going to 30 now or 35 now. So you'll just kind of count that down. And then your, um, your net, your driver knows that you're turning right. You're going to 35 and um, then next instruction, let your driver know right away. Now we're looking for a speed limit 35 sign and we're going to go down to 30 miles an hour. And you just finish that instruction, continue on to the next one. Um, you're going to stop. Are you going to stay sp holding. about splitting the sign? Steve, why don't you tell them how to split a sign? This is for drivers. Um, one of the things that the, the race is calculated as though you can start and stop immediately. Obviously, you can't. So if you can envision in your mind that sign on the side of the road, you're going to start slowing down before you get to that sign and get to your next speed on the other side or speeding up, depending on which one it is. This is where the driver needs to know how quickly his car will either slow down or speed up. Uh, it's a it's a rule of thumb thing that the driver just gets used to. Uh, as Basically, as long as you make that correction somewhere around that sign, you're going to be pretty close. The, the technique for splitting the sign exactly comes with experience, but you're you're not going to be far off as long as you make that speed change somewhere around where that sign is. So think of it as a linear deceleration. You're at 35, you're going to 30, so the sign will be right in the middle. So you're crossing it and continuing before you go down to that next speed. Make sense? Just nod your heads and go yes. Okay. Um, so again, same same thing at a stop sign in the next um, instruction. And then what we see is a stoplight, a blinker. I don't see a stop sign there. However, the instructions tell you zero and a 15 second pause. So what that's telling you is treat that blinker as if it were a stop sign. And then go through your regular stop sign maneuver. Okay, let's go on to the next page. <laughs> and um, then what I do um, in marking my route instructions, carry over the speed from the previous page. So because it says 30 miles an hour right there, but you won't know once you turn that page what speed you should actually be driving at. And so you can see down at the bottom of the previous page, you were at 35. So one of the first things that I'll do when I mark my instructions is I'm going to carry over that number at the bottom of the page to the top of the next page on every page. Okay. Uh, so you can see basically um, a lot of the same, same things. It's just, it's one instruction after another. Don't finish any, uh, don't go on to the next instruction until you completely finish the instruction from the, the, the previous instruction. Now here, the second one, you've got that little side road sign and there is a speed change. And so it's a combination instruction here. You've got a, a, a sign and then you've got a right turn and you've got a speed change from 30 down to 20. You are going to actually go down to 20 at that sign. And then you're gonna make your right turn at 20 miles an hour. So in to 20, out at 20 or down to 15 out of 20, depending on the car. Right. Okay. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a few questions that are, that are coming up in the chat and we'll, we'll have a question and answer time at the end. And so we'll, we'll kind of talk about those. If you're carrying tenths of second as a rookie, I'm really impressed. 
We're worried about minutes, not Texas. <laughs> Well, it's a good question, full, full and there sentence. is a way to do it. Yeah. But... yeah. All right. So again, you've got a you've got a sequence of of um, uh, turns and then stops, all at stop signs. So all very controlled, and then you see something in in the right column that says "Look sharp." That tells you that that um, Hearn Road is probably not easy to see. The the um, you can see the words are to the right, so that means that the sign is on the right. If the words are on the left, the sign is on the left. So Hearn Road, that it will probably be hard to see, so look sharp. And then you're going to make your speed change. You've got another couple of stops. So all, all very, very simple. So uh, continuing on to the next one. All right, so speed limit 25. Oh, there we go. Um, again, just a speed change. Oh, now we've got an empty box here. So that does not mean that you can just drive whatever speed you want to when you get to that left jog sign. That just means that there will be a left jog sign, but you're going to continue at 20 miles an hour at that sign. And that is probably um, just to let you know that uh, you notice the next instruction says, come quick, look very sharp. So once you see that left jog sign, you're going to be looking right away for that, that right turn, and you're not going to be able to see the sign because it's in parentheses. That tells you you're not going to be able to see it until maybe after you make the turn. Okay. So assuming you've made that perfectly, you, your out speed is 25 miles an hour. You've lost a second on your turn, apparently, on this one. So you're going to need to make that up. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then you've got your stop sign. Another comes very quick after that stop. You're kind of going on to a left curve and there will be a spur off to the right. So you've got a, a little bit of a clue as to what the road is going to look like and at what angle that that road is going to be that you're going to turn off. So um, now, uh, speed limit 25, making a right turn at a stop sign. He wrote down comes quick here. And there's a reason for that, because if you turn to the next slide, you will see that, that the instructions in the box, uh, go, go on to the next slide. Sorry. It's comes scary. quick. So you've got, you've got a speed change and you're going to need to run your, 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 um, stopwatch. Um, wait, wait, wait. We're too far. Back up one slide. Here was the comes quick. Okay. Oh no, yeah. this is so the, there's a comes I quick. The page. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that comes quick came came quickly after the previous instruction. So you know to turn the page quickly so that you're looking for that right curve sign. And, and again, there was um you see that he's he's drawn in um the number 20. That was the speed you were driving before. So what that's telling you, this is a delayed speed change. Once you cross that right curve sign, you're going to hold 20 miles an hour for one minute and 30, is that 36? One minute and 36 seconds, or one minute and 30 seconds. Um, so you hold it and then you will increase up to um, 30 miles an hour. So um, that doesn't happen very often, but if, if you see that there's a speed missing, you just write in the previous speed that you were driving. Um, and again, um, you're, you need to complete that instruction. So you hold that 20 for that, that whole minute, 30, whatever it is. And um, you're not gonna be looking for anything else except letting that time elapse before you move up to 30 miles an hour. And that's the end of the instruction. You move on to the next one which is uh, you've got a couple of stop signs. Again, you've got a, uh, a right uh, side road sign um, that you're going to be uh, decreasing your speed and then you're going to be making the turn at that, uh, at that intersection. You've got another um, at the, uh, the right jog sign. It's uh, a double speed change. So you're changing at the sign. This is on the next instruction at 25. You're going to hold 25 for a minute and 12 seconds and then increase to 30 miles an hour. Um, and then you've got to stop. You've got a hard left uh, intersection and, and it tells you, okay, you've got, you've got something on the right side that says possible construction zone. Um, so be watching for that. 
And then in the next one, you can see that there is kind of an X intersection sign that you will see before you make that hard left on River Road. And again, we've got a comes quick. So I'll look on the next page and you'll see another comes quick. And that is the end of the road work. Um, and you're not doing anything there. You're just maintaining that speed, but just note that you have to pass that sign before you will make that right turn onto March Road. So everything is sequential. You have to finish an instruction before you go on to the next one. And then we've got a stop, we've got another stop. Um, we've got a look sharp here on the right. First paved road, John Street. You're going to maintain that 20 miles an hour that you had before. Um, you've got to stop. You've got a speed change at a speed limit sign. Nothing hard here. This is just one instruction after another. Just follow it in sequence. Check them off after you've um, completed it so that you know which one you're on. You know, sometimes you'll look down and there, there might be two stop signs right in a row. It's like, oh my gosh, which one am I on? Make sure that you mark it off, check it off. You know, some people will just squiggle through the whole, whole thing. I like to save mine and so I like them to look pretty. Um, all right, so let's go on to the next slide. And um, so what we have, uh, again, just same turns and stops. And then you see that stop ahead sign um, with the top half of the hourglass. The, the sand is in the top half of the hourglass. This is critical. This is called the beginning of a transit. And that means that you're not off the clock, but you're temporarily on pause. So at that point, there's not going to be anybody out there again with a red flag or anything like that. You've got to grab your stopwatch you got to hit your stopwatch and you've got to write down the actual time of day, whether you're doing it from your stopwatch um, digital readout, whether you're doing it from your time of day clock, write down the exact time of day to the second that you cross that stop ahead sign. And you're going to take that number, that time of day, and you're going to add that 30 minutes to it that's in the column to the left of it. And you're going to carry that over to, and it says instruction number 70. So we're going to kind of flip to the next page real quick and then come back in. So you can see at the third instruction down next to the arrow, that's going to be your restart time. So you took that previous time plus 30 minutes. That is your start time at that, uh, at that restarts. So this is just taking you off the clock so you can have a little bit of a bathroom break. And um, then it will... Uh, so it tells you at that intersection with US 202, um, there will be a Gulf gas station somewhere around there. That tells you at that intersection, you're 10 minutes away from where the start is. And so, um, and it also told you under the hourglass how many miles that you're going to be traversing. So you're going 10 miles within 30 minutes. Not that you have an odometer. No, but just to give you a sense, it's like, okay, I know I've got 30 minutes, but how long does it take me to go to the bathroom and how far are we from where we are at the start? This is letting you know, you know, don't dawdle, you know, don't, don't drive 20 miles an hour, um, get from point A to point B quickly, and that will give you more time at your restart. Can I throw some uh, yes. driver things in here? Quickly, <laughs> we have 13 minutes. Okay, for drivers, when you have a stop sign, that's the easiest thing for you to do and keep in mind that you're going, uh, your next instruction is stop, turn left. The tricky bit is where you stop. Uh, you've been practicing your decelerations. And what I find is sometimes intersections are such that if there's full of gravel, which is common, you might slide a ways into that intersection uh, or you might stop too soon and you can't see down the road to watch the traffic that's coming up to you. Uh, as rookies, you just gotta creep ahead a little bit so you make sure you have a good clear vision as to what's coming down. Um, don't feel that you have to stay where you stopped if it's a safety issue. Uh, number two, how do you find roads? Uh, we're gonna be in the Northeast and I'm guessing there's gonna be some trees around there. And sometimes it's hard to see where the roads are. That can happen out in open field too. I look for things like if there's power lines going off to the left or the right, there's a chance that there might be a road right along those power lines. 
um, if you if you can see um, markers on the side of the road, sometimes they will delineate where an intersection be. Sometimes you're coming up on a hill and you can't see that there's a road there, is what I'm saying. Most of the time you can, and it's really easy. But there are a couple of techniques that you can learn for judging where a road might be that you can't see when you're, it's time for you to start slowing down. Okay, so we've finished our transit. So go on you to the next slide. Could I just ask, I I just ask one question? the second yeah. light here. Okay, just, so this is telling you that that um, turning left onto US 202, uh, after you've made the, the right turn at a stop on, on 111, there will be another stop light before you make that left turn onto US 202. Okay, so now we're back at, um, we've gone around Sorry, the traffic can I just, circle. Could I just ask one question about your, um, uh, the, the coming in and the clocking your time on um, uh, note number 65? And then at that point, you're okay. then off the, off the clock for 30 minutes. Yes. I understand yes, that. So and I understand that you're counting down and the bracket numbers are counting down to the starting point again. But you did say that it was 10 miles. Where did you pick up, pick up the 10 miles from? It was written down under the um, hourglass. hourglass. Under the first. That's just letting you know. Hourglass. Yeah, you so you you don't have you, an odometer, so you can't track that. That's just to give no, you a sense in the, your head. Those of, those okay, numbers underneath that first hourglass are telling you yes. how far it is to the next one. Yeah, it looks yes. like an odometer reading. Yeah, no, got it. See That's perfect. Moment. Answered. Perfect. perfect. Thank you. All right, on to the next page. Then uh, you've got a sequence of arrows. Um, we've got a right arrow, then a left arrow, then a left arrow, then a left arrow. You're probably going to be circling back on yourself. So, um, but before you make that restart, double and triple check your time and look for the cars around you. Again, pull out your order of start, make sure that the other cars are there. All right, next page. Uh, next page. There we go. So a right turn, a right turn. This is probably a maze. And so you will probably see other cars that are coming towards you. They might be coming from a side road. They might be coming right at you. And they might be at the same intersection as you. And you're supposed to turn right and they're turning left. Don't let that bother you. This is designed. It's very cute how he does that. Um, don't lose focus. Run your race, follow your instructions, do the maneuver, cross it off. Do the next maneuver, cross it off. Do the next maneuver, cross it off, and don't be distracted by anything else you're seeing out there. Um, now you see that that's a camera, video camera with a circle around it with a slash. That means that at that point, there will not be a checkpoint for a while. And that's probably because there is something that could cause you to lose time and, and you know, just kind of get a little bit off. So uh, you can see that there's a signal there. You may have a green signal, you may have a red signal, and you're going straight. So you could, you could lose seconds or you could be early and need to fix that too. But that lets you know that at least you'll have time to correct that after that, uh, after that camera uh, comes back without the circle and the slash. Um, and you will have time to make up any loss that you have. And uh, again, you've got a, a blinker being treated as a stop sign. And let's continue on to the next, next page. And this is my favorite instruction of the day is that clock with a slash through it that tells you you are off the clock it's the driver's favorite one too <laughs> <laughs> but if you see that coming up you know you're probably going to see a checkpoint crew somewhere in those last three instructions so just be aware make sure that you're on time you've made whatever corrections you need to so that you're ready to just wave at that checkpoint and go yes. uh, okay and then there's some information boxes so don't don't zone out once you're off the clock because now there's some really important things you're going to need to do you may need to stop for gas because and uh, that first box is going to tell you what's going to happen that evening 
It'll tell you about the host dinner. It'll tell you about any activities, tell you how long you need to stay at the park for May. And it will also tell you about parking information at the hotels. Okay, and then the next slide will tell you about, and then you then that will take you into the finish gate where you get a little sticker from um, Rachel Klassen. And um, then they'll give you your scores and um, you'll be given your start order for the next day. So you'll know how to do your calculations and know when to get up and when to get breakfast and all that good stuff. And it'll tell you where you're going to be picking up your route instructions. And it would also tell you that your first refueling stop will be in 135 miles. So make sure you've got at least a half a tank of gas. And it'll also tell you if you have a toll. Generally tolls at this point are all electronic. Um, sometimes it, they actually do it the old fashioned way with cash, but you'll be off the clock when you do, when there's a toll. So um, just be prepared. If you need to have cash for the tolls, then then you, you can get that. And they'll tell you if you do and how much it is. Yeah. All right, so that is our route instructions. And uh, let's talk about a couple of special situations real quick. And I know we're going to run over and I apologize for that because I want to allow time for question and answer, but um, time allowances, go ahead. Um, the race doesn't want you to do stupid things. And I think that's fairly obvious. Um, when you have a situation that's beyond your control, um, you there's the road is obstructed because a train broke in front of you and blocks the intersection and you have no way of knowing how to get around it or where to go and you're just stuck there, uh, which has happened recently, uh, the race crew will come by and give you instructions. If you run into a train out in the field and you have to wait a couple of minutes for it, you calculate how much time, generally as a driver, what you're looking for is the ability to pull over and stop, get out of the traffic. Uh, because once that train goes, whatever cars are in front of you are not going to be able to go the speed that you want to go. So you're just going to pull over and wait. Navigator will be running the watch. When you can go safely and to your speed, pull out. The navigator will figure out how to figure out the, uh, the 10 second increments that's required for filling out a time allowance may have you speed up, may have you slow down uh, so that you can hit it right at that 10 seconds and turn in the time delay to the next checkpoint official that's looking for it or asking for it. That will be either at the lunch stop or at the end of the day. And there's there are uh, two time allowance sheets that are stapled to the back of your route instructions. So you just pull one off, fill it out, tell them what happened. And you're not going to be responsible for making up a five minute delay if um, if it was beyond your control. Beyond your control, this is the trick. If you have a flat tire or you run out of gas or the car breaks and you get it back running again, those are not accepted as time delays. Or if you missed a turn and go five miles down the road and come back, not that we've ever done that. You know, or had a flat or had an engine <laughs> breakdown, you know, it, we've gone through all those things. But you can't, you know, you can't have, a car problem or your mistake it does not count for a time allowance. Anything legit where the road is blocked and you can't go, you can do a time allowance on that. Okay, next slide, making up time. When you can, uh, because you will have, you'll need to make up time for turns, you'll need to make up time um, you know, for whatever circumstances it is. Um, determine how many seconds you're late. And generally the best way to correct that is using the 10% rule. If you are five seconds late, um, you are just going to go to a speed that's 10% faster than the assigned speed. So you're, so you're, you're on a, a 30 mile an hour road and you've lost five seconds. You're going to go 33 for 50 seconds. So 10 times the number of seconds you are late at 10% over. What happens if you're right in the middle of that 50 seconds and there was a right curve sign and you had to change to another speed? Just change to 10% over that new speed and continue um, calculating your seconds. And then once you're done, you go back to the assigned speed and you're on time. And this also works when, you're, when you need to lose time. 
Um, it's, it's rare, but sometimes you have to leave early if there's going to be cross traffic or you have to speed up to pass a slow vehicle. Um, you go 10% over to pass that slow vehicle, and then you go 10% slower to make the correction. So um, use all the information available at your disposal, and that may involve hacking off of other charts, and we'll tell you how to do that another time, okay. maybe over a beer. Um, <laughs> Uh, next slide. When you're lost, um, sometimes you just blow it and you miss a turn or an instruction. Um, if you're driving at a, uh, a speed that doesn't correspond to the road, um, then you may be wrong. If you see a stop sign and there is not one on your course instructions, you may be wrong. If you're on a long straight road and can't see the car in front of or behind you, you may be wrong. So, Here's the deal, drivers. You're the one that's watching where you are in the race. Um, if suddenly you're getting the feeling like, damn, I'm driving too fast for this road, or I'm driving too slow for this road, or um, you, uh, there are nobody, nobody's on the side of the road watching the race go by, uh, and you're not sure. You just don't think it's right. Don't keep going easiest way to check that it's just pull over and stop where it's safe you know there's another race car one minute behind you if that car doesn't show up and the next car doesn't show up you're off course and this is when your navigator is going to hit the stopwatch as you turn around and go back to the and try to figure out the maneuvers the drove the turns that you've made to get to where you are to get back to the race course if you think you're on the race course, again, you can wait. Another car comes by one minute. Okay, now you know where the course is, where you went wrong, and how late you are because you have your order of start and you know that that car is uh, 10 minutes behind you. Uh, so you're 10 minutes late. You know, yeah. What do you do? Okay, so you're back on your course. Um, 10 minutes is hard to make up, especially if the speeds are fast. If you're supposed to be doing 45 or 50, you're not going to make it. Uh, so just write it off and get to where you're in the middle between two cars that are one minute apart. Uh, put yourself 30 seconds behind a car that you know is on the course and doing okay. And then when you get to the, the checkpoint, you're just going to lose that, that leg. Okay, you toss that one out. You got plenty to toss out. So that's a, that's a gimme. And then you start the next leg, 30 seconds behind the car that's a minute in front of you. Now you're on a regular leg. This is your position now because the checkpoint will, will mark you at that point. And if you stay on time and stay on course 30 seconds behind the car that's in front of you, you'll have a good leg. So the trick is throw away the bad leg and don't mess up the next leg, which can really help. Okay, and we are at time, but I want to allow for questions. I apologize that we're running a little bit late, but we tend to do that because we talk a lot. So um, any questions that we haven't answered from the chat? Um, Hi, Janet. Yes. This is Jeff. Um, and, and this is actually for Ken. Ken, can you, is there a way to uh, gather all the questions? So if we don't answer somebody's questions, I can uh, answer them uh, in an email uh, this week. Yes, when you when you quit Zoom, if if the questions were in chat, there'll be a little thing pop up. I'll also save it and I'll get that to you. And it's a dialogue just like it is there. If we don't get your questions answered, we'll answer them this week. Another thing is my email is Jeff at greatrace.com. If we don't answer your question tonight, somehow we miss it, just email me or Houston at Houston at greatrace.com and we'll answer those questions. I'll get everybody yeah, yeah, we're, yeah we're my email. We're, we're going to be in Michigan, and if you have questions there, we're going to have a, a, a little seminar in Michigan. We'll be happy to talk to you in person. We will have a seminar again at the start of the big race, so you'll be able to see us in person and ask questions in those places too. And I, I just email. I want to thank the veterans that were answering some of these questions yeah, along the way and sharing some of your expertise. That is. That's what this is. This is a family. We are here to help you. We're here to answer your questions, to, to help you to succeed uh, and just uh, also, enjoy the race as much as we do. I will get the, the clock 
and speedometer information and send that on, out in this week's newsletter. If you're not getting the weekly newsletter every Thursday, comes out at different times of the day, two or three in the afternoon. Sometimes it's five in the afternoon, Eastern time. If you're not getting that every Wednesday, send me an email at jeff at greatrace.com so that we can find out why you're not getting that uh, email. Um, this video will be available afterwards. Uh, several people have asked about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I want to thank and point out to all the veterans I've noticed on this call, Peter Hersey, who I already mentioned, Hank Mole has done yeah. a great job answering questions. Uh, Bob Merrick is on this, on this uh, video. My buddy, Ken Spencer, my Pebble Beach buddy, is handling the all the uh, uh, ins and outs of this uh, this whole deal, and I really appreciate that. My buddy from Maine, Harvey Lippman, uh, Sam Madavi's on this, and Sam is filming this great race uh, for uh, uh, several episodes of Sam's Garage on television. Oh, cool. uh, Sam's on this. Uh, Susan Norse and Peter Brown uh, are on this email. Our our host. They're, we're going to their hometown in Freeport, Maine this year. Scott Tams coming back finally after many years. Glad to see you back, buddy. And last but not least, Wes Thompson. Can't wait to see you in Michigan and in, on the great race. Uh, uh, and thank you. Hey, to Jeff, I have, a, I have a quick question. I'm, I'm looking kind of through the questions. And Shanna, who is a fabulous expert navigator, has a really good question. And I want to um, bring that up. Question about instructions uh, regarding position of a building rather than a sign as a marker before a turn. Sometimes you'll see a building shown in the route instruction itself, and there may be a, a change of speed. Do you change speed at the building, or is it just in the instructions as a reference? Just in the instructions as a reference. Okay. It's not so if there's a sign then you will change speed at the sign. But if there is a building, that's just so that you know you're in the right place. Generally, the building is on the corner, so it's a kind of a meet. Yeah. It, it, it'll oh. be like, you know, Arco Station or something like that. Yep. I also want to thank you, Steve and Janet. You are perfect for this. Thank you. This is not the end. Keep going. I just wanted to get those in before people started dropping off. Okay. And I, I, and I didn't want to point this out. I, I I ran across this, and some of you may know who Pat Summit is. She was the women's basketball coach at University of Tennessee for many years, one of the best. And she has a lot of really great quotes, and, and I love this one. Winning is fun, sure, but winning is not the point. Wanting to win is the point. Not giving up is the point. Never letting up is the point. Never being satisfied with what you've done is the point. To finish is to win. And that's what we'd like to leave you with tonight. Oh, raw. All right. So thank you all. And we will see you either in Owensboro or we will see you in, uh, in Michigan. So thank you all for being with us tonight. And uh, good luck to everybody. <laughs>